understood. If you want to help, the Second Harvest Disaster Relief Hotline is 800-344-8070. The website address is www.secondharvest.org. Most of the large food donations come from major corporations, but money from families can help distribute the food where it's needed. Again, Chuck Gowdy is coming along with a live update on the storm in just a few minutes. John? Diane, here at home tonight, 48,000 ComEd customers are still without power tonight because of yesterday's storms. There's a real soft sell in a gas station mini-mart at 127th and Marshfield. Proprietor Sam Subaki showed us ice cream and other perishables that are spoiling. And without power, the gas pumps can't be used. Other nearby businesses, including a McDonald's restaurant, also had to close because they have no electricity. Nearby residents are also without power. Part of the problem was caused by a big tree that was knocked down during the storm. As it fell, it toppled power lines. Diane? John, a chemical scare forces evacuations at the Cook County Criminal Courts building. About 100 people were evacuated from the basement when a suspicious bottle was found in the police evidence room. The bottle was filled with a chemical and hallucinogen and contained what looked like a fuse. Four people were treated for burning eyes. Tonight, the fire department says an investigation determined the bottle did not spill and there was never any chemical released. The court building is at 26th in California and connected to the county jail complex by a tunnel. Well, grief took hold on the northwest side of Chicago this afternoon. Police officers and other mourners crowded a funeral home today for services for patrolman Michael Sirioli. The 26-year-old was gunned down in August on August uh, 15th and died on Friday. The officers wore black ribbons on their badges to honor their colleague. Sirioli was on the force for only 18 months. His funeral is at 10 tomorrow morning. Five suspects right now are charged in connection with that shooting. Well, a member of one of Chicago's local school councils is behind bars tonight, charged with child pornography. Police say a tip led them to Michael Katz, and now investigators say that Katz has been involved in child pornography for years. ABC 7's Kent Ninomia is live tonight with the latest on the investigation. Kent? John, people who know Michael Katz describe him as a model citizen. He volunteered at his son's school. He volunteered as a Little League coach. And he volunteered here at Hiawatha Park, helping to run youth programs. The suspect, Michael Katz, lives in this house across the street from a playground. Mary Warren's daughter, Rachel, plays here nearly every day. When I was over here with my daughter, he was kind of like, oh, she's cute, you know, this and that, you know, how old is she, you know, and he was like, you know, I'm like, you know, come on, let's go, Rachel. So he was kind of, like, pushy toward her. 38-year-old Michael Katz is accused of running a child pornography computer bulletin board. Chicago Heights police got a tip about Katz. When they and the sheriff's police raided Katz's home, they found five computers and hundreds of CD-ROMs filled with child pornography. They're exploiting uh, young people, young girls, and they're very sickening. Uh, obviously, uh, it's child pornography at its worst. Katz is an electrical engineer. Investigators say he is married with two sons and is involved with children's activities. He is a Little League coach and on the board of directors of the Hiawatha Park Youth Program. Katz is also involved in the PTA and is a member of the Bobian Elementary School Council. Rhonda Travolo says Katz asked her to vote for him. She's the mother of a seven-year-old girl. Very, very nervous. Um, very upset. Um, I'm glad he's in jail. And Katz will remain in jail at least until his bond hearing tomorrow morning. He faces two felony counts, one for the possession of child pornography, another for the reproduction and dissemination of child pornography. Reporting live from the northwest side, Kent Ninomia, ABC 7 News. Diane. Thank you, Kent. Four people who worked for Amico and developed cancer are now suing the company. They worked at the Amico Research Center in Naperville. This is a class action suit that includes relatives of three other workers who died with cancer. The suit charges that Amico installed an inadequate ventilation system that exposed the workers to dangerous chemical vapors and fumes. Amico says the company has not seen a copy of the suit so that the company cannot comment right now. John? Well, Diane, it's back to class for Chicago's public school students. Mayor Daly began the new year by ringing an old-fashioned handbell outside the McPherson School on North Walcott Avenue. McPherson is one of 14 schools that were repaired over the summer thanks to a $1.8 billion construction and renovation program. Students came back to some changes. 
Metal detectors are now mandatory at all high schools in the city. Some students at DuSable High School said they feel safer after all the gun-related tragedies in schools around the country last year. Bus service has also changed. 18 schools have opted to start an hour early at 8 a.m. so their buses can also transport students at other schools. The new schedule saves $5 million from the transportation budget. When we come right back, another bomb attack against an American target overseas, this one in South Africa. Also, he suspected of planning the embassy bombings. Now there are reports he tried to kill President Clinton. And later, say goodbye to needles. There's a new way to inject medicine. It's all still ahead. Tonight, the White House is condemning an attack on South Africa on Planet Hollywood, a popular restaurant there. It happened in Cape Town on the southwest coast of South Africa. President Clinton is calling it a despicable act. He said the U.S. is cooperating with investigators in South Africa to figure out who did it. It was at the height of the dinner hour, and the restaurant was packed with people. Police in Cape Town say it looks like the bomb was thrown into the restaurant from the street. One Muslim group says the bomb is in retaliation for the American airstrikes on Sudan and Afghanistan last week. One person was killed in the explosion today, more than two dozen hurt. Diane, there are reports tonight that the alleged mastermind behind the U.S. Embassy bombings in Africa, Osama bin Laden, also plotted to assassinate President Clinton. Newsday magazine says the exiled Saudi millionaire and his followers first tried to kill the president during a 1994 trip Clinton took to the Philippines. The plans were canceled because security was too tight. He also reportedly considered another attempt during a scheduled trip by Clinton to Pakistan. That trip was canceled by the president. Today, bin Laden was also indicted by a federal grand jury for the embassy bombings. Well, he's being remembered tonight as a Southern gentleman. Retired Supreme Court Justice Lewis Powell has died. Powell was appointed at age 64 to the high court by Richard Nixon. He said at the time he was too old to serve. Some say he played a pivotal role in shaping American law. It was Powell's vote that tipped the balance when the court first upheld affirmative action. Justice Powell died early this morning at his home in Virginia of pneumonia. He was 90 years old. Well, John, one of the best-known actors in the business has also died. E.G. Marshall made a career out of playing politicians, lawyers, and judges. He was 88 years old. Marshall continued to perform well into his 80s. He most recently played an aging tycoon, starring with Clint Eastwood in the film Absolute Power. He also gained fame and two Emmys for his portrayal of attorney Lawrence Preston in the 1960s courtroom drama The Defenders. Marshall died after a brief illness. Still ahead, Jerry Tapp puts more sunshine in the forecast, but first, we'll get a live update on Hurricane Bonnie as it churns toward the Carolinas. ABC 7's Chuck Gowdy is on the coast tonight. Also coming up, a special alert about hazards that may be in your own home. And later in sports, the Cubs try to stay close in the wild card race. It's all still ahead. On the health beat tonight, imagine no more needles when it's time to get a shot. Clinical trials are about to start on a new needless treatment. It uses compressed gas and the injector comes pre-filled. The device is held up to the skin and pressure is applied to release a gas which sprays the liquid into the skin. It's easy to do and requires no special training to use. One drawback though, it could cost up to 10 times more than a normal injection. Well, John, a consumer group is urging people to check their homes for hazards. The Chicago-based Coalition for Consumer Rights released a report on recalls today. It's called Luring Threats, Hazards in the Home, and studied 25 months of recall notices issued by the Consumer Product Safety Commission. The most deadly products are bunk beds, blamed for 54 deaths during the period, halogen lamps, blamed for 11 deaths, and play yards for 13 deaths. Children's products are recalled most often. Although we as parents um, are obligated to ensure that we put our child's safety first and to be vigilant, being vigilant is not always enough. We have to, as consumers, keep negligent manufacturers accountable. The coalition says the civil justice system has to go after the makers of dangerous products. John? Well, let's get an update now on Hurricane Bonnie. The strong storm is headed toward the North Carolina coast. It should hit land sometime tomorrow. We don't know exactly where. ABC 7's Chuck Gowdy joins us live on the North Carolina Outer Banks tonight. Chuck, what's the latest? Well, John, it's a good bet it'll be right about where we're standing sometime tomorrow. It was really a nice, quiet, peaceful late August evening here on the North Carolina coast until about 10 minutes ago when the wind kicked up to where it is right now. 
and the waves are really cooking out there at this hour. But of course, this is merely an appetizer to what we will see in about 12 hours when forecasters say the waves will be about 10 times as high as what you're looking at now, and the winds will hit well over 100 miles an hour here along the coast. So Chuck, right now, uh, we see the woman there playing with her child on the beach tonight. Are they under mandatory evacuations right there? I know they're hoping for the storm to turn north, but what's the situation? Well, there were mandatory evacuations all day, and what the governor said was that anybody who did not honor the mandatory evacuations would be informed that their next of kin would have to be notified. So that was kind of a final incentive, but some people still decided to stay behind. The hurricane itself, Diane, right now is estimated to be about 250 miles southeast of where we are on the coast of North Carolina. That's about the distance between Chicago and Detroit. It's moving at 16 miles an hour, so if you do the math, tomorrow doesn't look like a very good day here. And so, Chuck, concerned colleagues of yours here want to know, when are you leaving? Well, we'll stick it out for a while. We've got uh, pretty secure quarters here. You know, there is some concern by, by people uh, who have left the island today that there's another wallop out there, uh, Hurricane Danielle, which is uh, approaching the U.S. Virgin Isles at this point. Uh, right now, only 80 mile an hour winds, but the experts say that by the time uh, three or four days passes, that hurricane could be up well over 100 miles an hour as well, and they're not really forecasting the course for that one yet, so it could be a double hit here on the East Coast. Are they closing roads uh, where you are, Chuck? They've closed off the roads uh, inbound, uh, but there aren't many people trying to get in here at this hour anyway, John. How many are left around you there? You look all alone. Well, there are a few uh, media types around here. Uh, actually, it's surprising that the, the hotels right around here are completely full. There are some people who have decided that they want to experience a hurricane. They've checked into the hotels, if you can believe that right on the coast. But it's, uh, it's largely the media and uh, some what you might call rubberneckers. Where angels fear to tread, huh? Right. <laughs> Thank you, Chuck. A lot of people want to be the first interviewed after the storm. Well, they're going to be rubbernecking it tomorrow morning out there. Uh, the interesting thing is the storm surge should be about 11 to 12 feet, which means the water level will go up 11 to 12 feet and then five to six foot waves on top of that. So where they see the level of the water, it could be 15 to six feet, 16 feet higher and go as much as four to five miles inland. So. I still don't think he's in a real good spot out there. Do you think it might, there's a possibility it might turn or that it's... Well, it, it, the center of the storm is wobbling. We'll take a look at that uh, now on the latest satellite. So it still does not have a real definite course. They say that it's moving to the north-northwest at about 16 miles an hour. But if you look at the center, it's wobbling kind of like a top. And if it continues on the course that it has now, it'll actually hit quite a bit further south than was initially forecast. It was initially forecast to start turning to the north and hit portions of North Carolina around Cape Lookout and Cape Hatteras. But again, if it keeps moving the way it's moving now, it looks as if uh, some of these uh, hurricane warnings may be a little bit further to the north because if it keeps moving the way it is now, it's right along the uh, South Carolina and North Carolina border. But they are expecting it to hit a little bit further to the north. They have Hurricane watches down to Savannah, up to Cape Romaine, hurricane warnings uh, up into Virginia, and then also some uh, hurricane watches to the north of that. And Chuck mentioned uh, Hurricane Danielle, which now has 85 mile per hour winds. It's still about 1,500 miles to the east of Puerto Rico, so it's not an immediate threat. But here's the one hurricane that we are working with now, but we do have another one out uh, overseas, and we'll be watching that over the next couple of days. Here in Chicago, a great day tomorrow, chance for showers on Thursday and Friday, but not tomorrow. We had a high today of 85, 5 degrees above the normal high of 80. It'll be in the mid-80s again tomorrow. 71 now at O'Hare, 74 midway, 78 at the lake. The winds are west at 6, and the humidity right now is 73%. Satellite pictures, we really didn't have a problem. We did have some fairly heavy showers and thunderstorms that moved to the east of us across Ohio. But here this evening, we have clear skies, and we're expecting a lot of sunshine tomorrow. Radar, you can start to see some of the uh, rain from the hurricane now affecting uh, portions of North and South Carolina. But high pressure for us will be pushing in tomorrow, so we will have sunshine. So we'll be back here in the sun while uh, <laughs> they are having a tough time out there, and hopefully uh, Chuck will be all right. 100 today in Phoenix, 101 in Dallas, 85 in Chicago. We're expecting temperatures tomorrow in the mid-80s. So the forecast tonight, clear and cooler. 
Upper 50s inland, upper 60s uh, downtown. Tomorrow mostly sunny and less humid with a high of 85, turning a little bit cooler near the lake tomorrow afternoon. Chance for rain on Thursday and Friday and a nice weekend coming up. A little bit cooler with highs near 80 degrees. So a beautiful day tomorrow, some rain Thursday and Friday, and a nice weekend. You're worrying so much about Chuck, you know, yeah, you could have gone. <laughs> no, I could have wasn't worried I about you. No, 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 I like, I like, it's nice and dry right now. Right. Right. Doesn't much your hair down there. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm here, right, tonight's all my lottery numbers. Also coming up, turning a maze into a work of art. And I'm Archie and Greco coming up in sports. The Rick Meyer era about to come to an end. No tears, please. No. no. The ball game is not over to the last out. Right? That's right. And the Cubs are like El Nino <laughs> of baseball. It's all about weather with these guys. That big black rain cloud followed the Cubs down to Cincinnati tonight. And they're trying to fight through it right now. Two more rain delays. Hey, hurry up. I'll get home plate. You get second base. No, wait. Somebody get third. Come on, hurry up. Everything's getting wet. Sammy hasn't homered yet, but he did boost his RBI total to 129. Knocking in Lance Johnson here. Dimitri Young flops at the track. That allows Grace who I think has a cinder block in his underwear to eventually score. Down 8-3, they rally, and in the seventh, Gary Gaetti bangs out his first homer as a Cub, a two-run pop. Hey, it's 9-8 Cubs right now. And it was one of those nights for Roger Clemens. The Rocket reared back and fanned 18 Royals, allowing three hits and a 3-0 victory. His 16th of the year, his 11th straight. Cleveland routed Seattle 10-4, but Travis Ryman had a rough night. Goes for this foul ball and flips over the tarp. Initial diagnosis was dead but it's just a nasty gash back here Sox and orioles here's a rip foul and there's your gratuitous butt shot right there and you think that hurt in the seventh inning the big one crushed a two-run missile to left for frank is 24th of the year that gave the Sox a 5-1 lead moments later birthday boy albert bell celebrates by jackie number 39 the Sox win it six to four and now, doesn't that feel a little bit better now? <laughs> By the way, Mark McGuire, 0 for 4 tonight. More NFL cuts today, the most notable. Ron Paulus and Donnell Wolford are out. David Klingler, Will Fewer, Billy Joe Tolliver, and Leland McElroy also got pink slips today. Up at Hallis Hall, Dave Wanstad released Randall Hill, James Allen, and put Thomas Lewis on IR. And as expected, it looks like Rick Meyer is going to be next if he doesn't agree to take a pay cut within the next two days. Right now, it sounds like Rick is not too willing to take one for the team. I've uh, really been patient with this. Uh, try to give it every way to work, you know, a lot of time, uh, a lot of patience, and uh, if it's meant to be, it'll happen. If it's not, it won't. Waiting to see what, what happens with Myers deal, to be very honest with you, and, uh, you know, we want to make sure that, uh, that, that Stenstrom and Moses get plenty of work, and, uh, you know, we're optimistic that this thing might get done, but it's got to happen pretty quick. In other words, he's cut. More trouble at Camp David. Maybe Camp Ditka, really. Uh, hazing got out of hand as a rookie ran the gauntlet and nearly lost an eye, and he could have permanent damage. Stuff goes on around the whole country, military, everywhere, and in the field. I'm sure it just never came out like this because it's never caused anybody serious damage. Want to line them up against the wall and shoot them all? What do you want to do? There's nothing you can do. You know, some people are innocent because they're proven innocent. Some people are innocent because no one ever proves any, finds any proof against them. Exact the money. <laughs> Briefly, the Blackhawks traded goaltender Chris Terreri back to New Jersey for a draft pick. And before we go, Mike, can you talk a little more about that hazing incident? I've talked about it for four days, and I refuse to talk about it anymore. That's the last thing I'll say about it. So well, you guys sometimes will... you talk to one person about it, though. You don't talk to us in general, and so we don't know all, what you All said. you have to hear listen to is the radio after the game. I talked about it specifically. That's the only time I had a chance to really talk about it. Okay, well, talk to us about I it. I just so. did. <laughs> Boom! <laughs> well, that's, that's where we get all our sports news out of the radio, there you isn't go. it? Oh, yeah, it's very easy to show she, out She was right very there. good, I thought, but he, he still got it. You know, he danced away. Oh, boy. He's losing it. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. When we come back, Idaho is corny. We'll be right back.
Finally tonight, another report on what to do with a bit of spare time and a whole lot of corn. The corn in this field in Idaho is 10 feet tall, so the farmer couldn't resist his love for the state, and he put it on there. If you make all the right turns, they say it can take almost an hour to walk the two-mile path, but it's almost impossible not to get lost in the forest of corn. Boy, out there, they say you need a unique sense of direction, or heck, you could spend three hours there. They say, who knows, you might not be found until the harvest comes. Hmm. Reminds me of some of my nightmares. Is it a maze exciting. or something? Yes, it sure is. Yeah. Want us to I mean, re-rack re re that and explain it to you? Oh, oh, get into yeah, maze of maze. Jeff, could you run it again? Oh, yeah. <laughs> For, for, for Jerry. Okay, thank you. Talk about getting lost. He doesn't need that maze. He doesn't need it. Well, that's our report for tonight. Nightline is next here on Channel 7. I'm John Drury. Was it good? You liked it, yeah. I'm Diane Burns. Thanks for joining us. Good night.